Hi everyone, um, we're going to talk about WebAssembly for IoT devices, interfacing with USB and I2C hardware. And I am Merlin, I'm a researcher at iMac and I teach at Ghent University. Uh, I also work a lot on open source stuff, including a, a WebAssembly system interface. Hi, I'm uh, Michiel van Kenhoven, but you can call me Michael if that's easier. And I'm a PhD candidate at IDLab. IDLab is a doubly affiliated uh, research group at Ghent University and IMAC. I'm also a teaching assistant uh, where we mentor multiple master thesis students. So, WebAssembly for IoT devices. Um, one way to explain this very easily is just to look at how old certain IoT devices are. The average lifespan of cars in Europe is 30 years. Um, this is mostly in Eastern Europe. In Western Europe, it's a lot less. Um, but just imagine 30 years ago, our developer tool change, chains were basically running on Windows 95. So how do you update software on a car that uses a compiler that was initially built for Windows 95? If you're familiar with the embedded space, then, then you know that a lot of times, either these are custom-built compilers or forks of open source compilers specifically for that hardware set, or sometimes they're even closed source compilers that you don't even have the source code of. Um, and some of these manufacturers, they literally have Windows XP virtual machines running simply to be able to recompile the code for some of these old cars. Um, so how do you update this software? Well, very, very slowly. There's a lot of research looking at, okay, what is the age of software in a car? How many vulnerabilities are there in a car? And stuff like that. And the number of vulnerabilities um, and the number of CVEs is increasing each year. Um, in some sense, this is a good thing because a CVE means that we actually found the vulnerability, but it really, the, the reason that it's uh, rising so rapidly is because more and more people are looking for them, and the more people look for vulnerabilities in cars, the more they actually find them. Because, for example, um, it's incredibly common to have an OpenSSL version in your car um, that is over 10 years old. OpenSSL is basically the foundation of any security system uh, 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 in, in, in net, net, networked, networked applications. And so if this is two years old, it's full of security holes. If this is 10 years old, when that, then you, you can basically use Base64 as encryption and it would be equally uh, effective. Um, so it's, it's so bad even that recently in the US, uh, 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 they saw a real increase of Kia thefts, and they figured out that there were actually a bunch of kids who were using TikTok in order to teach each, each other how to, um, how to hack into a Kia. Uh, so how do we solve this problem? How do we distribute software to um, uh, millions of devices with very different architecture, very different software versions, and completely backwards compatible? Well, we, we actually already solved this issue for browsers. Every time you open a website, your computer downloads the latest version of this website and then runs it locally in order to give you that functionality. So why don't we just use this for IoT devices. Um, that's the ID. Um, WebAssembly and WebAssembly system interface for embedded is basically the ID of, okay, trying to improve the situation of software distribution and software updating for IoT devices, for embedded Linux, and even for microcontrollers. Um, it has a lot of advantages compared to just compiling software natively to these uh, uh, embedded devices. For example, you have binary device portability across all these instruction set architectures. Um, I think Amazon recently released that they targeted like a few thousands different kind of devices with just a single WebAssembly binary. Binary. Um, they support much more programming languages, and they have language interoperability on embedded devices. 
Most embedded developers right now are using C, and it's not only because they really like C, but it's also because there's basically very few other languages that compile to these devices. With WebAssembly, we can compile anything to WebAssembly, um, 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 and it doesn't matter what the native compiler of the platform is. Um, you also get forwards compatibility, and this is where it's starting to, to become really interesting for automotive, for um, industrial IoT devices, for basically devices that have lead times, uh, that, that have lifetimes measured in decades instead of in years. Um, secure and sandboxed execution of software, this is also a very interesting one because WebAssembly gives us this concept of virtual machines or Docker containers on devices that are too small to even run Linux. We have a prototype running on a microcontroller that has 265 kilobytes of RAM. Um, however, very, very important, and this is where the real differentiator comes with things like the Java Virtual Machine, is that it supports pre-existing software. You just recompile any existing software to WebAssembly, WebAssembly system interface, and it should work or it will work uh, in the future. And it has near native efficiency in execution and compilation. Um, last year, when I was here at WasmCon, uh, uh, one of the representatives from Bosch uh, put this slide online as uh, basically the idea that WebAssembly can act as a narrow waste of automotive software, um, making sure that this incredible uh, uh, diversity in languages and compiler tool chains all compile to WebAssembly, and then that can be used to target this incredible diversity of applications, uh, operating systems, different types of hardware. Um, and they defined a few challenges, and I was very interested in the first challenge that they defined, because defining unified interfaces from WebAssembly to the underlying software layers. Well, this is actually one of the things that we're working on. We call this cyber-physical WebAssembly. Interfaces to connect WebAssembly applications to hardware. Thank you. Um, and the actual goal of using WebAssembly on IT devices uh, is to make drivers more secure, or at least that's the goal in the future. So that drivers can only access what they actually need instead of the current situation where drivers have almost full access of the operating system. Um, this will ensure that we can defend against supply chain attacks in the future. Uh, by sandboxing third-party drivers. Um, but you can also componentize uh, these drivers, um, making sure that you can, once you have an update, ju you just replace the component with a new driver component, and then it should just work without needing to change the application logic. This brings me to the portable drivers um, goal in the future, that you write a driver once and you can run it anywhere. Um, of course, this is not the case today, but in the future, um, this is the goal. Um, and in this way, we can actually support newer hardware on older platforms. So imagine we have an IoT device right now with a uh, specific sensor, and in five years' time or 10 years' time, the sensor breaks down, or there is a newer version of the market that has uh, way higher um, precision, and we want to use the new sensor on the older platform. In the current situation, you cannot easily um, run the new driver on the older platform. So that means that you would probably need to buy uh, a new platform um, to make use of the new sensor. Uh, with WebAssembly, this wouldn't be the case since we can easily um, just replace the driver component with the newer driver component of the new sensor without needing to change your application logic. Uh, and this uh, brings us to the cyber-physical WebAssembly um, current architecture that we have uh, designed. Um, and here on the left side, we are focusing on WebAssembly I2C, and on the right side, on WASI USB. Um, and there are multiple methods you can use uh, WASI, I2C, and USB. For example, in the left side, we have the hardware abstraction layer embedded inside the same um, component. Um, and on the right side, the driver is a separate component. Um, so depending on, on which use case you have, you can easily uh, change the component, uh, for example, on the right side uh, with a new driver. But for example, if you don't use the component model, um, you can also use, um, uh, you can also uh, embed the driver inside uh, the WebAssembly uh, binary in this WebAssembly module. Um, 
then we make use of the capability-based security uh, that WebAssembly offers. Um, and we also have an extra additional access control list security um, below the capability-based security to ensure more fine-grained uh, control. Um, then the host component will essentially talk to the host operating system stack um, to do the low-level operations. As, as part of building this, um, working towards this vision, um, we are standardizing a couple of these interfaces. For example, WebAssembly system interface dash USB is an interface to connect WebAssembly applications to underlying USB devices. Um, this is a complete cross-platform interface that you can just target as an application developer, and then the runtime will actually translate any calls that you make to the underlying native USB APIs. Um, we have based this USB interface on uh, the API of libUSB instead of webUSB. As some of you might know, WebUSB is a thing that exists in Google Chrome, which allows Java, which, which makes it possible for JavaScript applications and WebAssembly applications to talk to underlying USB hardware. But that interface is quite a high-level interface, not, re not really optimized for IoT devices. Um, therefore, we focused on libUSB. LibUSB is basically a de facto standard USB interface because almost all applications uh, uh, that talk to USB devices cross-platform use LibUSB. Um, it's an interface that's very, very close to the actual hardware capabilities, so it is incredibly powerful and it is fully compatible um, in the sense that um, our, our host implementation uses LibUSB in order to target all the different platforms that LibUSB supports, um, um, including Windows, Linux, and a few other platforms. Um, but because we then expose the same LibUSB API uh, as a standardized WebAssembly system interface API, um, client applications that program against LibUSB can simply be compiled to WebAssembly to then target WASI USB instead of LibUSB, and then also um, 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 run cross-platform. Um, then the second interface that, that, we're, that, that we're building as part of this, um, the first interface is a phase one WASI proposal. This is a phase two WASI proposal. Um, this is uh, 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 in order to connect to I2C devices. Um, this interface, the API of this interface is based on embedded HAL. Um, again, a cross-platform library in order to connect to I2C devices. Um, and we specifically chose um, embedded at HAL because um, um, it is incredibly close to hardware and it is cross-platform even across real-time operating systems like Zephyr. Um, so it was very easy for us to design this interface and then build WASI Embedded HAL Create um, that basically implements this interface for any Rust application um, that uses the, this interface. They can just recompile and use our crate in order to then run inside of WebAssembly and talk from WebAssembly to I2C devices. Um, but very easily, it would be very easy to also implement this interface in other languages um, um, in order to uh, basically be able to compile any existing application that talks to I2C devices to compile it to um, uh, uh, WebAssembly. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time here, so if you're really interested in how we act actually build these interfaces and how we, we are um, working on to standardize them, we have a paper on this uh, that we submitted to IEEE IFIP NOMS, and the preprint is available um, on ArcSIF. Uh, the slides that we are showing here are available for download on the uh, schedule application, so you can use uh, the URL in the slides to access the paper. Um, and what we also did in the paper is did a little bit, a little, little bit of research on what the overhead was that the uh, WebAssembly implementations have. And we, we came to a conclusion that the, the, the overhead is actually almost non-existent. Uh, for example, on an x86 Linux host machine, uh, when we measured the round-trip time to an external Arduino 33 Nano, um, 
device uh, using USB, we only have a seven microsecond uh, increase in uh, median uh, round trip time. Uh, when we look at ARC64 Linux, in this particular case, the hardware was an Raspberry Pi, which is less powerful, and therefore the relative overhead is also bigger, so at 8%. But if you look at the absolute values, it's only 45 microseconds added to the median round trip time, so still almost non-existing. Um, what, what's, what's maybe interesting to, sh to, to note here is that this added latency is so small that it actually, it, 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 it still fits into a single USB window. So from a perspective of an application sending data, it might very well be that there is simply no latency because it's simply waiting for the next window until it can start sending data. And so in practice, especially on x86 Linux, there is just no observable uh, latency because it has to wait longer for the next window in order to start sending again than it has to wait for the overhead of WebAssembly. Yeah, and on, on x86 Windows, we see that the, the overhead is even smaller at only two microseconds. So actually non-existent. Um, we also tested the USB throughput, and we did uh, different tests with uh, sequential reads, sequential writes, also random reads and random writes. Uh, in this particular case, we're showing the uh, sequential reads, so that means trying to read as much as, uh, blocks as possible in a sequential way. Um, and then the other um, transfer modes like sequ uh, sequential write, um, of course, the absolute values will be different, but the uh, overhead that we observed is um, comparable to the one we are showing here. Uh, and we see that we only have a 0.6% decrease in USB throughput on x86 Linux, and then the same story for uh, the Raspberry Pi uh, case, where we have a little bit higher of relative overhead of 4.1%. Um, but this is, in my opinion, very respectable. Um, we have ongoing work at, uh, at iMac and Genshin University. Uh, everything is open source. Uh, so the, the, the WASI I2C proposal is in phase two, like Merlin just said. This is a collaboration with Siemens. Uh, the WASI USB proposal is in phase one, where we have actually two implementations uh, available. And then we're also working on GPIO and SPI. But that work is in, so an early, in, in, in such an early stage uh, that we can't really talk about much about it. But if you're interested in that, give the repos uh, a star, and then you will be notified once we start working on it. What I, what I maybe want to add here is that um, proposals before phase three, proposals are basically expected to change a lot. So right now we have the interface proposals. We have prototypes that, that use these interfaces and host implementations. So you can actually start trying it out if you go to these uh, repositories. But know that uh, some of these interfaces might, ch might still change before they become a phase three proposal. Once it's a phase three proposal, basically the same rules as the other uh, 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 preview two WebAssembly system interfaces will apply, which means uh, uh, forwards compatibility with newer uh, system interface uh, uh, versions. Um, we're also working on uh, proposals for GPIO and for SPI communication, um, although we don't have anything to show for these as of yet. Uh, and that brings us to uh, uh, demo time, where we're actually going to show you how we can use the WASI USB proposal to control, uh, to, to run a, a driver for an Xbox controller in WebAssembly. Um, so we have here an, uh, a, a WASM time uh, runtime implementation that supports the WASI USB um, interface. And then we have an Xbox Maze.wasm, which is the guest application that has the driver for the Xbox controller. So what does the driver do? It sends commands to the Xbox controller and then reads out the data that the Xbox controller uh, sends back. Um, and then we can interpret uh, the data that we received um, to then show uh, which buttons are pressed, what the state is of the joysticks. Um, and to make the demo a little bit more exciting, I tried to create a very simplistic version of Pac-Man. Um, so let's try it out. So you can see that we are now, this, 
this important to note is that this is completely running uh, in WebAssembly. So this is the guest application, and the driver that we have for the Xbox controller runs in WebAssembly. So if I move a joystick, you can see that the values that are being read um, are displayed on, on, on the screen. Um, you can also see that when I press a button, for example, the, the A button, it lights up green. Uh, and when I move around with the D-pad, I can uh, eat my food. Um, I can eat the uh, non-scary ghosts in this case, because the ghosts don't do anything. Um, but it's just to show that we can run um, a driver for USB in WebAssembly. Um, and so, obviously, like, this being used for Xbox controllers, this is not really the application that we're thinking of. The application that we're thinking of is, for example, a car or an industrial IoT machine that 10 years, 15 years after it was created, um, so one of the components breaks. You want to plug in a new version of that component instead of either having to reflash the firmware of that device to support newer drivers for the new uh, uh, component. Um, you can simply load a new WebAssembly driver for the new component in order to have the old device with the old firmware simply uh, 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 still working, uh, connecting to newer uh, peripherals. Yeah, so this proof of concept shows that it is possible to run drivers in WebAssembly for USB. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't show a, a, an I2C demo uh, because then we need, would need to show the hardware uh, here, on, uh, here on, on stage, and I'm not sure if people in the back would have done, <laughs> be able to see what was actually going on. Um, so to reiterate what we just shown is that we have an Xbox controller, USB driver, and Pac-Man, completely in WebAssembly using WASI USB. Uh, in this particular case, we're embedding the driver in the same WebAssembly component. We could also have split up the driver in a separate component, which is what you would do in an ideal scenario in the future, uh, so you can easily swap out the driver um, if, if you need a new driver version. So before we finish, I also want to uh, uh, make a little bit of an advertisement for our um, um, workshop. So for the um, um, academic uh, people in the audience, um, we are doing uh, 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 an academic workshop, WebAssembly-focused workshop um, at the IEEE NOMS conference. Um, uh, if you're interested, if you have work on WebAssembly or work on uh, 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 solving problems for uh, either the cyber physical space or the Cloud Edge continuum, um, we're really interested to see your work. Um, the submission deadline is the 17th of January. Um, this workshop is being co-organized by uh, 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 the Bytecode Alliance and uh, IMEC. Uh, and co-funded by the, the, the European Union. Okay, so massive thanks to uh, a whole bunch of people who helped us with this and worked on this. Um, um, the Bytecode Alliance is an, a very interesting and uh, a very fun partner to work with. Um, um, we were also very happy to see all this uh, uh, positive, uh, 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 all this excitement about uh, the work that, that we're doing. Um, if you're interested in any of this work, uh, please send me an email. If you want to follow uh, future updates about this work, you can always uh, follow me on LinkedIn, and I always post when we have new papers out or new uh, demos or prototypes to show. Um, and as you can see, uh, building stuff like this uh, takes a lot of people, so that's why there's a massive amount of people there. All right, thank you. Um, if there are any questions, we're happy to answer them. Yes, I'll start uh, there.
Yeah. That's, that's a very good question. So the question is basically, let's say that um, there's a new I squared C controller. Um, where is the code that implements support for this new controller? Um, so the WASI I squared C API, this is basically the hardware abstraction API. What's above it is the application, the WebAssembly application that's cross-platform. What's below it is simply the implementation, the host-specific, controller-specific implementation of this uh, uh, API. So if there was a new I2C controller, this new I2C controller would have to be changed, uh, uh, would have to be supported either in the host runtime itself, if the host runtime is directly talking to the controller, or it can be implemented in the operating system, and then the host runtime can simply have a, 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 host, uh, a host implementation that simply uses the operating system APIs. So when we talk about the current demo that we have, for example, uh, one of the current demos runs on Linux. There we just basically forward all the requests to the Linux I squared C APIs, which then implements support for the different controllers. Um, our API is built in such a way that we can very easily modify this to also run on Zephyr, for example, but one of the prototypes that we have, that prototype basically runs um, um, directly on a microcontroller without an actual RTOS, and so for that specifically, the implementation is part of the runtime, part of the runtime itself. Thank you. Uh, hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, awesome idea and project. Uh, so you showed you compared the latency for native compared uh, with uh, USB drivers written in Wasm. Uh, what runtime did you use? Did you use Wasm time? Uh, I'm just trying to understand if it's JIT, uh, just time compilation, or it's actually like pure Wasm instructions. Uh, we're using Wasm time and just in time compilation, yes. Uh, gotcha, thank you. These uh, latencies also still include the overhead of the component model, shared nothing model where um, um, any data has to be copied once it transfers the boundary between the component and the runtime. Um, I know that in the embedded group we're working on um, some interesting ways to, to reduce the amount of copies. So we actually expect this overhead to even reduce uh, in the future. Good, thank you. Thanks, so uh, this uh, uh, Zephyr RTOS driver, is it written as a Zephyr application on the top of the Zephyr RTOS or is it something that is, uh, that needs, you know, that, that, that is kind of embedded into Zephyr? And, uh, uh, so, and also how portable is this? Do I have to, let's say, write uh, for every operating system, for every architecture a new kind of driver that exposes on the north uh, side uh, the specification for the WASI interface and then on the bottom side uses some uh, interfaces of the underlying uh, operating system. Yeah, so we don't have a prototype running on Zephyr right now, um, but I can tell you if we would implement it, we would implement it as an application on top of Zephyr. Um, we wouldn't have to touch the actual Zephyr kernel or code itself. It's just the, the, the I squared C APIs that Zephyr provides are good enough for us. And so in terms of, yes, you need to port it to every single platform. You need to port it to Zephyr and Linux and Windows, but um, you don't need to port it to any architecture or any device because most operating systems, most devices at least support one operating system um, and we just use the operating system for that final translation. Uh, Thanks. So I was looking at your performance data and I'm really wondering about, you, you, you talk about the latency, but what about determinism? It looks like your determinism what you showed looked a little better, but how exhaustive of a test was that? 
Um, you know, can you really talk to that determinism numbers that you're seeing there? Um, so can you repeat the question, please? Why the determinism, you? you talk about latency on those, on the USB or on the I2C, but what's the determinism? What's your worst case scenario on that? What's the determinism of that, of those calls? So as, as you can see here, the, the determinism basically seems to be about the same. Um, I think for, for the ARCH example, um, the determinism seems to be even a little bit better in our implementation. But I think that this might just be artifacts of how the operating system drivers work for, for the USB stack or maybe how the, the USB controller works. Um, but we, we don't really see any difference. Um, you see the outliers uh, on this graph, outliers are marked as basically the dots. And so it, it's, it's not like, like, like we suddenly have outliers uh, uh, that are bigger than what we see natively. So this is a complete set. You didn't, you didn't prune off any outliers. This, this is the complete set, yes. And, and the outliers are mainly caused by having to wait on the next USB transfer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Some, sometimes the few microseconds additional latency causes us to miss a window and have and, and that's basically the outlier yeah. because we're using here the bulk transfer but if for some reason because it has the, the, the it has the lowest priority for example if, if an interrupt happens at the same time the bulk transfer will have to wait but we're using bulk transfer because when you send a bulk transfer it is being pushed immediately on the bus when it's available instead of an interrupt for example it has uh, periodic um, updates um, yeah, I just have a quick question, and also that's a confusion I have. So you introduced that those um, those WASI uh, USB and escrowing in phase one, phase two, um, but over these past two days, we keep hearing that you know WASI P1, P2. I'm wondering what are they? The phase one here is the WASI P1. So these are P2 proposals. Um, we do want to also. But have a way to backport them to P1 because some of the runtimes targeting embedded like Whammer, WebAssembly micro runtime, it only supports P1 and it won't change uh, in the near future. Um, so we want to actually backport these interfaces to P1, but currently our WASI proposals are P2 proposals. Okay. Hi. Um, Quick question, have you looked into uh, resource sharing and mutual exclusive access to an AskWC, for example? So you have two sensors connected, two applications running on it, but only one AskWC controller. We have not looked at it at all. This is something we're planning to do this uh, uh, academic year, th this cycle, basically, um, to really get a good grasp of how does concurrency work, how does resource sharing work, for the API itself specifically, um, we, we provide an API that is very similar to Zephyr, for example. So we, we looked at, we just thought about resource sharing uh, for I squared C. We looked at how Zephyr is doing it, and Zephyr is basically giving you the gun and uh, 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 hoping that you won't shoot yourself in the foot with that gun. And that's what our API currently does. But we haven't actually tested how all well this will behave and how this will interact with async, concurrent, multiple components running at the same time. This is something we want to better investigate, what, 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 what the effect of that will be. Okay, cool, thanks. Then let's connect on that. Cool. Are there any other questions? Uh, I think my question is essentially related to what, what you just said, but uh, my question is, what are the considerations you did for capability-based security for these APIs? And yeah. like, for a serial part, I can't just say serial zero, one, or two if I wanted to be able to restrict it past specific references, the non-forgeable tokens for uh, capability-based security. What were the considerations that went into the design of these APIs? Yeah, so in our current proposal for WASI USB, we provide capability-based security up to the level of a specific device connected to a bus. Um, so 
um, 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 we can give an application using capability-based security, we can give an application exclusive access to a single device, and it won't have access to any other devices on the same bus. And this is basically implemented in the API itself. We don't need to add any ACL layer in order to have that. Um, for I squared C, our current standard um, implements the granularity for um, capability-based security is on the level of the entire bus. Because if, if we do it in another way, then we are less compatible with existing APIs. Because basically, capability-based security, if you want to make a capability-based secure API more granular, then you need to change the API, which might mean that it's not compatible with existing applications. For USB, we found a very easy way to, to, to do that. For I squared C, um, it's currently not that way. We're, we're, we're still investigating whether or not, because in my opinion, in the ideal situation, we should be able to do the same for I squared C. Give an application access to only one address on a bus, not the entire bus. However, if you want to go even more granular, um, we have this ACL security layer. Uh, this is a, 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 a prototype built by Siemens, which basically allows you to check any call, any call that you make, check it against some, some uh, access control list. Um, to have even more granular um, um, security, um, um, uh, even more granular than, than what the API provides uh, you with. Yeah, and the, the ACL security, for example, would even be allowing certain values to be sent and other values not to be sent. For example, if you have certain control sequences for your uh, USB device and you don't want the, the application to access those to change the configuration of the USB device, you can just deny those in the access control list. Uh, I see we are at time, so. Maybe, maybe just, um, um, we are looking for experts on what makes sense here. For USB, for example, we have the possibility to do it even more granular. Um, but we have no idea whether or not it makes sense to give a single application access to only certain commands of a certain USB device or is, yeah, uh, uh, we, we're not experts in, in the USB protocol itself. So if people um, um, have opinions about that, please come to us and tell you your uh, opinions uh, uh, because we're, we, we would be very happy to hear them. Actually, can I, one more follow, quick follow-up question on that is, uh, how, would you, how do you imagine the ACL-based security being implemented? Like, it sounds like it could be a feature of like WASI vert and that style of tooling where you compose it into your API can have, and have configuration settings for, for the security at that layer. Yeah, the, the current prototype implements it as part of the runtime itself, but indeed with the component model, you can just plug in a filter component that implements uh, this ACL uh, uh, security without actually having to modify the runtime. Yeah. Thank you everyone for uh for listening. If you have any core questions, feel free to come, uh, come up to us. We are here for the rest of uh, KubeCon. And uh, enjoy the rest of KubeCon, let's say. <laughs> <laughs>